So let's talk about uh, longest chain consensus. And in this lecture, um, for continuity, let me tell you about longest chain consensus in the permissioned setting. So with a known uh, set of nodes like we've been working with in the last several lectures. Um, now, mind you, you know, maybe the biggest win you get from longest chain consensus is how gracefully it extends uh, to the permissionless setting, where actually you have no idea what are the nodes running the protocol. But don't worry, that's going to be the next order of business. Um, so in lecture nine, we will extend the longest chain consensus protocol that we talk about in this lecture. We'll extend it uh, to the permissionless setting by blending in a second idea, something known as proof of work that we'll be discussing uh, in the next lecture, in lecture nine. So a quick side comment. Um, so let me remind you that you know, a recurring theme in this course is we're going to emphasize principles over protocols. Uh, and again, in many treatments of blockchain, what people do is they tell you sort of specifically how one particular protocol works, with Bitcoin being um, the most frequent example. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I totally understand how satisfying it is to take a sort of very important piece of software in, in the world, like the Bitcoin protocol, and understand in detail kind of step by step how it works. Now, again, my goal is not to teach you how any particular protocol, Bitcoin or otherwise, works. That said, you know, we will, as a byproduct, learn how various blockchain protocols work in this lecture series. Uh, but I'm really trying to teach you kind of the, the basic building blocks that we currently have at our disposal from which we can assemble various different blockchain protocols. And if you just study Bitcoin for Bitcoin's sake, I mean, you wind up kind of smushing together, conflating a lot of different really sort of distinct ideas that go into the protocol. Ideas that don't necessarily have to be bundled together, that can be mixed and matched with other building blocks in the design space. So this lecture, we're going to focus squarely on one innovation of the Bitcoin protocol, namely uh, its use of longest chain consensus. It's embrace of forks uh, and this in-protocol way of resolving the ambiguity that's introduced by forks. And again, this is on super novel, even in the permissioned setting. It's exploring a different part of the design space than any of the previous protocols had done and thereby offers a different set of trade-offs. Next lecture, we'll isolate a second innovation of the Bitcoin protocol, which is the use of something called proof of work in the context of consensus protocols. And it's this ingredient, this idea, which will allow us to very gracefully extend what we do in this lecture in the permission setting to the permissionless setting, where you actually have no idea which nodes are even running the protocol. Now, I'm going to be trying to keep these two conceptually distinct concepts sort of as separate as possible, right? So on the one hand, you know, given a whole bunch of blocks that have been proposed, you know, how should you in protocol figure out which ones have been confirmed, which ones count? That's what longest chain consensus addresses uh, versus, you know, who is it that even gets to propose those blocks in the first place? That's what proof of work solves uh, in a permissionless setting. So. I have to warn you, I'll be able to keep them mostly separate, but they inevitably interact a little bit at the interface, okay, at their, at their edges. So there will be one point in this lecture, and I'll be very explicit when we get to it, where the way I describe longest chain consensus, um, and also sort of uh, what an adversary might be able to do to manipulate it, um, that description will be influenced by the fact that in the next lecture, uh, we will be doing um, the selection of block proposers using a proof of work solution. So two really separate things in your mind, keep them separate. You know, first of all, what's the rule for deciding which transactions actually count given a whole bunch of blocks that have been proposed? That's what longest chain consensus addresses. And then secondly, who is it who gets to propose those blocks in the first place? That's what uh, proof of work addresses. The combination of these two things, longest chain consensus with block proposers being selected through a proof of work mechanism, uh, those are probably the two biggest ideas in the, in the Bitcoin protocol. And sometimes you hear people say Nakamoto consensus to mean the combination of longest chain consensus with uh, proof of work mechanism for selecting block proposers. All right, so let's really get into it and how, you know, understand how longest chain consensus works. Uh, you know, to be honest, I had a, I struggled a bit with trying to figure out the best way to explain longest chain consensus because uh, I kind of want to address a couple different audiences simultaneously, right? So maybe some of you out there don't really know much about blockchains or about consensus, you know, other than what you've already learned thus far in this lecture series. And of course, we've only been focused thus far um, on the permissioned setting where you have a known, everybody sort of knows the nodes running the protocol um, in advance. We're also going to be thinking about the PKI setting uh, where all of the nodes uh, public keys are known to everybody in advance. So that's going to be one audience where you're already kind of attuned to this permissioned plus PKI setting. Um, and then, you know, the second audience is going to be those of you that actually have some um, familiarity with so-called permissionless blockchain protocols, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum being two 
uh, canonical examples. So these are protocols where you do not have advanced knowledge of who's running the protocol. You know, rather any random person can go sort of you know download a reference client from the web and you know and start running the protocol themselves. So the people running the protocol in a permissionless setting, they're coming and going, and you have no idea you know who they are. But you'd still like the the protocol to to retain consensus among the nodes that are running the protocol. So I'm going to basically be addressing both those audiences at the same time. Um, in some sense, the primary focus of this lecture will be on the permissioned plus PKI setting. So if that's what you're comfortable with, then you should just sort of follow sort of the main part of the narrative. Um, there is going to be a fair number of comments that are basically kind of forward pointers to the um, permissionless consensus protocols that we're going to talk about. In fact, two different genres of permissionless consensus protocols, um, proof of work protocols, which we'll talk about in detail in lecture nine, and also proof of stake protocols, which we'll talk about in detail in lecture 12. So if you don't know what these two phrases mean, if proof of work, proof of stake, you know, civil resistance, if all those concepts mean nothing to you, uh, don't worry about it at all. Okay, that's really not a prerequisite for understanding lecture eight. And like I said, we'll cover those topics in detail in lectures uh, nine and 12, respectively. But so even though, you know, you know, I want to emphasize that understanding proof of work or proof of stake is not a prerequisite for understanding the main points um, of this lecture, I do still want to make a number of comments along the way for viewers who are familiar with, you know, some of those concepts, you know, for example, maybe you've studied, you know, uh, proof of work blockchains that use longest chain consensus, like say Bitcoin, or the original version of Ethereum, uh, or maybe you've even studied some proof of stake uh, protocols that use longest chain consensus, uh, with Cardano and Tezos being uh, two notable examples. So that's the, the first reason I'll make a number of comments about proof of work and proof of stake uh, blockchains, because hopefully those comments will resonate um, with some viewers that have the, the relevant experience. Um, there's also a, a second reason I'm going to actually include lots of forward pointers to uh, our future lectures on permissionless uh, consensus. And, be, and the reason is, you know, that's where you really get the payoff. Uh, you know, of the novel, you know, the novel idea of embracing forks and uh, resolving forks in protocol, where that really pays off uh, is in the permissionless setting. So in particular, you know, the longest chain consensus works particularly well in the synchronous model. So that was the same sort of, um, you know, relatively strong assumption about um, the reliability of the communication network that we studied in lectures two and three, where there's an a priori known bound capital delta on the maximum delay that any message might possibly suffer. And you assume that literally every message ever delivered uh, arrives there within capital delta time steps. So like for a protocol over the internet, you know, maybe you'd set capital delta to be, you know, the equivalent of 10 seconds. And then on a good day in the internet, all of the messages um, are going to be arriving there, you know, within the, within the stated time bound. So we will, you know, sort of briefly talk about the partially synchronous model at the very end of lecture eight, just to sort of stress test longest chain consensus and see sort of what breaks down when you do have network outages and attacks. Um, but for most of the lecture, we're going to be proving kind of positive results about longest chain consensus. And those are all going to be uh, in the synchronous model with this um, bound on message delay. And I have to warn you, you know, that when we're talking about the synchronous model and when we're talking about the permissioned version um, of longest chain consensus. And given that we're using the PKI assumption, you know, I have to warn you that version of longest chain consensus, right? Synchronous permissioned PKI, that version, that that's basically a strictly inferior version um, of a state machine replication protocol that we saw a long time ago, way back in lecture two. Remember in lecture two, we were also using those three assumptions, permissioned synchronous PKI. We reduced state machine replication to Byzantine broadcast. Uh, we showed how to solve Byzantine broadcast using the Dole of Strong protocol, uh, and that satisfied you know, termination, agreement, and validity, even if you had 99% Byzantine nodes, um, which meant we got a state machine replication protocol satisfying consistency and liveness, even if there's 99% Byzantine nodes. And what we're going to get here from longest chain consensus is we're going to get consistency and liveness only when you have at most 49%. Byzantine nodes, not 99% like we got in lecture two, but 49%, okay, which is not nothing, you know, that's still, you know, an interesting guarantee, um, but it is, right, that version of longest chain consensus in the permissioned model with PKI is strictly dominated by the one derived from Dole of Strong. So it's once we pass to the permissionless case and we involve civil resistance uh, mechanisms like proof of work and proof of stake in lectures 9 and 12, then we will be getting fundamentally new protocols that are going to be doing things that no consensus protocols we knew about before will be able to do. 
Okay, so that's the sense in which the true payoff of longest chain consensus is in the permissionless case. But again, I really want to sort of tease apart on the one hand, you know, this idea of sort of in protocol embracing and resolution of forks, you know, versus the quite separate notion of civil resistance, which we'll tackle in, in, in lectures nine and 12. So here's what's going to be happening on this slide. On the left part of the slide, I will be writing down the high level pseudocode for how longest chain consensus operates. And so for those of you that are totally new to all of these concepts, I would at least, you know, on a first viewing, just focus on the left part of this slide. Just get a sense for like, as an algorithm, what is it the longest chain consensus is doing? Now, on the right hand part of the slide, I'm going to be writing down a number of assumptions. And these will be the assumptions under which longest chain consensus has the properties that we want. Okay, specifically, it's going to have, uh, as a state machine replication protocol, it will have consistency and liveness with up to 49% uh, Byzantine nodes. The description uh, on the left is going to be relevant simultaneously for the three different settings I mentioned, the ones um, sort of written down in magenta at the top of the slide, permission plus BKI, permissionless proof of work, permissionless proof of stake. So the description on the left will be relevant simultaneously for all three of those settings. Uh, and then the assumptions I'm gonna write down on the right-hand part of the slide, uh, I'll make some comments about you know, how you enforce those assumptions with a concrete instantiation of longest chain consensus for each of the three settings, the permission setting, the proof of work setting, uh, and the proof of stake setting. So first of all, every longest chain consensus protocol has baked into it a notion of a genesis block. So this is a block that doesn't have any transactions, but it's just sort of hardwired into the protocol so everybody knows where the blockchain's going to start. And so that will immediately bring us to our first assumption, which is really just gonna be a, a trusted setup assumption. So we're not going to enforce this assumption inside the protocol itself, because it's actually an assumption about the deployment of the protocol. Specifically, we will assume that the Genesis block B0, that is not chosen by an adversary. Okay, so the Byzantine nodes didn't get to choose what it is, um, nor did Byzantine nodes have advanced knowledge uh, of what the Genesis block uh, is go was going to be. So that's gonna be our trusted setup assumption. It's exactly the same for all three of the settings, permission, proof of work, proof of stake, whatever. Um, it's just gonna be a trusted setup assumption. So we're gonna remain silent on, on why this might be true. Uh, we're not gonna worry about somehow enforcing it you know, in the concrete implementation of the protocol. You know, in the same way that we assume that an adversary didn't tamper with the code you know, running the protocol in any of our honest nodes, we're going to be assuming that an adversary wasn't privy to the, to the Genesis block in advance. So returning to the pseudocode, um, the way I'm going to describe longest chain consensus is going to be a notion of rounds. And the blockchain is going to grow larger in each round. So the appropriate interpretation of what a round means is going to be different for different settings. So the permission setting versus the proof of work setting versus the proof of stake setting. In the permission setting, you're sort of already familiar with this. We've seen a bunch of protocols um, where there's a notion of sort of time steps or of rounds. And for example, you know, nodes take turns as leaders in the, uh, across the rounds. So permissioned um, and synchronous setting, it's gonna mean you know, much the same thing. Um, we're thinking about a, a global shared clock. You, know, you somehow split time into sort of intervals and each of those intervals is going to correspond to some round. Right, so obviously, you know, the, the amount of time in a round should be long enough to do something interesting. So maybe it's, for example, long enough that the nodes can do one invocation of the Dole of Strong protocol um, in a given round. The interpretation uh, in proof of stake protocols is going to be basically the same. You know, typical proof of stake protocols also have a sort of shared notion of time. You sort of split time into time steps, you know, where a time step is such that, you know, some particular computation is supposed to happen. Now, interestingly, in proof of work longest chain protocols, like Bitcoin, for example, um, the rounds are not going to correspond to sort of intervals of time, except in sort of a very loose um, average sense. In fact, for those kinds of protocols, you know, Bitcoin included, there's, you actually do not need to assume that the nodes have a shared global clock or any reasonable approximation of it, which is a pretty remarkable property. So rather, you know, rounds there are defined in a purely event-driven way. Okay, so if you know a little bit about proof of work, you know that, you know, basically people are sort of trying to produce blocks and they need to sort of solve these hard crypto puzzles to earn the privilege of producing a block. And basically whenever, you know, some node solves one of those crypto puzzles and sort of, you know, gets the keys to produce the next block, we're just going to call that the next round. Okay, so in a proof of work context, the rounds just correspond to the events of the nodes successfully solving crypto puzzles and producing blocks. 
And again, you know, if all this proof of work, proof of stake commentary is kind of over your head, don't don't worry about it. Just think of round as corresponding to some block of time steps, just like in all the other permissioned uh, protocols that we've discussed thus far. So what is it that happens in a round? Well, the first thing that happens is one of the nodes, and this will sound familiar, one of the nodes is chosen as a leader. So how does this leader get chosen? Well, that really depends on which of these three settings we're talking about, permissioned versus proof of work versus proof of stake. Permissioned, you should have a good idea of how this might go. For example, you could just use round robin, right? In the permission synchronous setting, there's a global shared clock. Everybody knows what time it is. Everybody knows exactly what the nodes are. So everybody knows, for example, if there's 100 nodes and it's currently time step 107, everybody knows that node number seven um, is the current leader. At a high level, you should think of what's going on in, in proof of stake blockchains as being pretty much the same thing that's going on in the permissioned case except with the leaders chosen um, each round uniformly at random, uh, rather than using a deterministic round-robin order. Now, that's not quite right. It's not quite right that you, that you choose one of the nodes running the protocol uniformly at random. Rather, you choose one with probability proportional um, to their stake. Okay, so usually nodes have sort of put some money in escrow on a proof-of-stake blockchain, and then if you own a 10% amount of the stake that's in escrow across all of the nodes, you're going to have a 1 in 10 chance of being selected um, as the leader. There is definitely more nuances there, and we'll discuss those in lecture 12, but high level, think of proof of stake as like the permission case, right? Each round corresponds to sort of a time interval, you know, and then somehow, you know, we'll talk about how this is done in lecture 12, you know, somehow one of the nodes is chosen randomly uh, as a leader. The idea in proof of work blockchains is similar, except that rather than sampling um, some node to be the leader with probability proportional to some locked up stake, um, you select a node with probability proportional to the fraction of the um, overall computational power that they're contributing to the protocol. We mentioned how you don't really have a notion of time steps in the in the proof of work case. You just have these uh, would be block producers, you know, trying to solve these hard crypto puzzles. Um, and basically, you know, whoever is the first one who solves that hard crypto puzzle, that's going to be by definition the leader um, of the ensuing round. So we're going to need a, a couple of assumptions uh, about this, uh, this selection of a leader in step 2A of longest chain consensus. Um, and unlike a, our first assumption, you know, our trusted setup assumption that Nakamoto wasn't mining on, you know, mining Bitcoin back in 2004, um, unlike that assumption, which we just sort of take on faith, these next assumptions is really important that we enforce them, you know, in a concrete instantiation of the protocol. So maybe an analogy would help to, to, to convey what I mean. So remember, like, way back in our first lecture or two, we introduced this notion of the ideal signatures assumption. You know, this idea that there should be digital signature schemes uh, so that signatures are unforgeable on messages you haven't seen before uh, unless you happen to sort of um, know the appropriate private key. So that was just an assumption. So we said, let's assume we can sort of produce unforgeable signatures, and now let's look at the cool things we can do. Like we can do the Dole of Strong protocol, the Byzantine broadcast. Separately, you then have to say like, okay, but if you really had to implement this protocol, like how would you implement it so that that assumption really was true, or, or for all practical purposes, true, that signatures were unforgeable? And the answer there is, well, that problem was solved, you know, um, several decades ago. You would use a, one of the well-known secure digital signature schemes, you know, like, for example, ECDSA. So the next couple of assumptions I write down on the right-hand part of this slide. They're really just going to be sort of analogous to the ideal signatures assumption. We will assert them. We will then investigate, you know, if they are true, you know, what properties does our protocol have? And then separately, in a specific instantiation, we'll ask, okay, how do we make sure that those assumptions actually are true? Okay, so assumption number two is that um, the election of a leader should be verifiable. And I mean that in two senses. So first of all, if you are chosen as the leader of a round, you should be able to prove that fact to all of the other nodes running the protocol. And then conversely, if you're not the leader of a current round, there's no way you should be able to trick the other nodes into thinking that you are the leader of that round. This assumption, you know, will mostly um, take care of itself in the specific instantiations of longest chain consensus we're going to be looking at, right? Like if you're in the permission setting and you have the PKI assumption, this is not a hard assumption to enforce, right? I mean, uh, there's already a shared global clock. There's already sort of a globally known set of node names. So everybody knows in advance without any communication, which node is the leader of each round, right? If there's 100 nodes and it's round number 107, everybody knows that node seven is the, is the leader of that round. 
And of course, with the PKI assumption, everybody knows the public key for node number seven. So whatever node no number seven wants to say as the leader of times of round 107, it can just sign it with its private key and everybody else will um, be fully convinced that those are the appropriate messages. And similarly, anyone who's not node number seven will not be able to trick anybody into thinking that they were in fact um, the leader of that round, of round 107. It'll turn out, you know, that the permissionless cases also sort of work out uh, in a pretty simple way, both proof of work and proof of stake. As we'll see when we study those in depth, we'll see that basically being a leader kind of means having a proof that you're a leader. That's almost like the definition of what it means to win this election uh, in step 2A. So the next assumption, also very important, uh, it needs to be the case that nodes, in particular Byzantine nodes, uh, have no ability to influence the selection of a leader uh, in step 2A of the protocol. So this again is an assumption that we're gonna sort of in any concrete implementation, we, we need to make sure that this assumption gets enforced. Now, if we're working in the permissioned setting, this assumption is, is not a big deal, right? It, there's a known node set, shared global clock, there's this round robin order, literally, you know, the entire sequence of leaders till the rest of time is common knowledge at the start of the protocol. So obviously none of the nodes can, can manipulate, um, the, you know, who's the leader when in the, in the permissioned case. Much more interesting to talk about um, the permissionless case. Uh, you know, although here, honestly, you know, proof of work, you know, as, as we'll see in lecture nine and as practiced in, for example, Bitcoin, things work out actually in sort of a very simple way. Um, so under something known as the random oracle assumption for cryptographic hash functions, um, that basically says that, you know, all of these would-be block producers, you know, trying to sort of um, crack a hard crypto puzzle to earn the privilege of, of producing a block, um, basically, there's nothing you can do to solve those crypto puzzles other than just, you know, randomly guess. Keep throwing darts at a dartboard until you sort of, by luck, um, hit a bullseye. And so from that, it follows that there's really no way you can manipulate the probability that you're going to be selected. You're going to be selected with probability proportional to the number of darts that you throw, and there's really nothing else you can do about it. This issue is quite a bit trickier in the, in the proof-of-stake world, and indeed, sort of, Many early proof of stake blockchain designs did not do a good job of enforcing this assumption. Newer designs do do, do a much better job of enforcing this assumption. Um, you know, just to give you kind of a sense of like wh why is it harder um, for a proof of stake than for proof of work? In a proof of work protocol, you kind of ha have this natural external source of randomness, right? You have all of these, you know, all your nodes are sort of throwing darts at a dartboard. You know, one of them is going to get lucky and hit the bullseye first, and then that get that gets kind of imported, you know, into the protocol as the winner of this election, as the as the as the node who gets selected as a leader in step two A. So the the state machine replication protocol, in some sense, isn't really responsible for figuring out who the leader is. It's almost like this sort of external natural process of people throwing darts tells you who the leader is. Proof of stake blockchains, meanwhile, or at least sort of most of the designs, are, are kind of hermetically sealed environments, meaning that, you know, there's really, you know, all of their computations kind of use only things that are known to the protocol itself. Okay, the original code of the protocol, and then also a transcript of what's happened in the protocol thus far. There is no external source of randomness. There's no analog of the, you know, so, you know people outside the protocol throwing darts uh, at the dartboard. And as soon as the protocol is itself responsible for pseudo-randomly kind of selecting leaders in step 2A, you know, based on the only information it has, which is kind of like the protocol code and the history of the protocol thus far, all of a sudden you got to start worrying about, well, you know, maybe nodes are now going to try to actually kind of manipulate the history of the protocol thus far so that it somehow biases future pseudo-randomness in favor of that node. So that's why proof of stake design gets quite tricky uh, around this assumption. Again, there's some uh, cool ideas to deal with this that we'll talk about in lecture 12, um, but you do seem to need, you know, at least moderately fancy cryptographic primitives um, in order to enforce this in, in a proof of stake context. All right, so going back to the protocol code, let's talk about the, the, the last step, step 2B. So what is it that a leader gets to do in a given round R? It gets to, it gets to create uh, some number of blocks. And here by a block, you know, as usual, we mean an ordered sequence uh, of transactions. If the want, the leader can, can create nothing. If it wants, it can create one block. If it wants, we're going to allow it to create uh, multiple blocks in a given round. However many blocks the leader creates, each of those blocks must specify a predecessor block. Okay, so if you, if you have a block 
you know, that doesn't have a predecessor specified or that specifies some non-existent predecessor, that block doesn't count. All the honest nodes are going to ignore it. Um, so to have any chance of sort of being counted, um, each block must have a predecessor to some uh, other existing block. If nothing else, it could be the, the Genesis block. So this is a departure from what we were doing in our BFT type protocols, like say Tendermint that we discussed in lecture seven. Uh, remember that like in Tendermint, you know, assuming that less than a third of the nodes were Byzantine, you know, we really showed you're never going to have two different sort of block number eights, right? To be finalized, a block needs a super majority of the votes. And if less than a third of the nodes are Byzantine, you can't get a super majority on two different blocks um, for the same height. So there's only gonna be one block number eight, there's only gonna be one block number nine, only one block number 10. Um, etc. So, you know, at that point, you don't need to write down the predecessors. It's obvious what they are, right? The predecessor of block number nine is block number eight. But in longest chain consensus, remember, we're going to allow forks. So we're going to freely allow there to be multiple um, blocks that are the potential block number eight, multiple blocks that are the potential block number nine. And as soon as you allow sort of multiple blocks sort of at the same height, now really you really do need explicit back pointers, right? So one of the sort of blocks, you know, at height nine needs to specify which of the height eight blocks is the one that it views itself as following. So that concludes the description of the basic protocol, the basic idea of longest chain consensus. You know, already even at this level, we can see that we can fruitfully visualize uh, the data structure being grown as an in tree. Uh, in tree meaning a tree in the sense of a graph that's uh, connected in a cyclic that's directed and where all of the edges are directed sort of toward the genesis block. Genesis block acts as the root of this in tree. So why do the blocks form an in tree? Well, it's just that we can, you know, visualize the blocks that have been created as vertices of a graph um, that have out degree exactly one. Okay, with each vertex uh, having a directed edge directed to the vertex that corresponds to the predecessor block. So you'll notice here, you know, in the, in the orange picture I've drawn on the lower left, you can see there's a, a single arrow pointing out of every single block, except for the Genesis block, uh, which acts as a root. Um, notice that you can have multiple blocks claiming the same other block as um, the predecessor. Right, so it's true that all of the out degrees are exactly one, except for the Genesis block, but the in degree could be potentially large. And you can see in that picture, the Genesis block, as well as one of the other blocks, actually has in degree two. So the picture you should have in mind is that when you first fire up this protocol, sort of all there is is B naught, all there is is the uh, Genesis block. And then as the protocol continues, you know, rounds keep sort of passing, you have leaders, they create new blocks, you know, you get this sort of tree growing from uh, left to right, okay, with all of the all of the newly created blocks pointing back, pointing to the left to whichever block they're claiming uh, as a predecessor. The extremely eagle-eyed among you uh, may have noticed that what I've said so far actually doesn't rule out that there might be some like weird directed cycle sort of floating around, distinct from this orange entry. Um, so this next assumption, assumption four, I mean, it's it's this is not the most important thing it does, but it will in particular rule out the possibility of any directed cycles in the entry. It really truly will just be a single entry uh, like is written on the bottom left of this slide. And so this assumption states that every block created in round R must, must as its predecessor, refer to some block created in a previous round, R minus one or less. So this fourth assumption, you know, like the second and third ones, this is something we're gonna have to take care to enforce in any concrete implementation uh, of longest chain consensus. It's not obvious from what I've written on the slide so far why A4 should be satisfied. Now your first reaction may be, oh, wait a minute, is this really assumption? Why isn't this just like true? Like why isn't it true that you can't refer to something that doesn't exist yet? Uh, but let me point out two things um, that, you, that we would be worried about. Worry number one um, would be, you know, remember that in step 2b, we're allowing a Byzantine node to um, create as many blocks as it wants in a given round. Now, as we'll see, an honest node is supposed to only create a single block in step 2b, but Byzantine node can create as many as it wants. And so in particular, it could, it could sort of create a set of round R blocks that point to each other. So that would be a, a violation of assumption A4. We have to make sure that that's, that's not possible. The other thing we're sort of worried about is the possibility of a Byzantine node um, kind of delaying its announcements, right? So like imagine you had a Byzantine node that was elected the leader at, at, at uh, round number 17. And then imagine it kind of didn't send any messages to anybody and just watch the protocol proceed for 10 more rounds up to round like number 27. Uh, and then it sort of says, oh, by the way, here are my round 17 blocks. 
and it specifies as predecessors some of the blocks that were created in the meantime, in between uh, rounds 18 and 27. So that would also be a way that a potential way that a Byzantine node could violate this assumption A4. So those are the two things in our concrete instantiation we have to make sure that Byzantine nodes aren't able to do. So this fourth assumption, you know, to be honest, it's actually not really that hard to enforce in any of the concrete instantiations uh, we're going to be looking at. Um, like, for example, think about the, the permission setting. And let's also assume the synchronous model and, as usual, uh, the PKI assumption. So, for example, you know, one trick you can do is you can have blocks expire, um, right? So to prevent a Byzantine node from sort of announcing a block, you know, well after the round in which it was the leader, you can just have honest nodes ignore any blocks they hear about that uh, belong to rounds considerably, considerably before uh, the current time step. You still could have, say, a Byzantine node kind of, you know, announcing a whole bunch of blocks in round R on time, but having them sort of point to each other. So round R blocks claiming other round R blocks um, as predecessors. Um, but again, honest nodes can just detect that. You know, remember, we're assuming that blocks are sort of annotated with the round number and signed by the corresponding leader. Um, so, you know, all the nodes can see that these round R blocks are pointing to other round R blocks and know to ignore, you know, all of them or maybe all but sort of the earliest one. Proof of stake blockchains use roughly the same circle of ideas uh, to enforce this assumption A4. Uh, proof of work blockchains actually, you know, this thing, this, this assumption just sort of takes care of itself. The reason for that, as we'll see in next lecture, in lecture nine, uh, is that in effect, um, in proof of work, a node has to specify its predecessor before it's actually notified, whether it's the, um, the leader of the next round. So in effect, you know, the winning lottery ticket saying that you know you are the leader of the next round the winning lottery ticket has encoded in it which predecessor block you must use and of course it can only be some block that existed at the time you know that you entered the lottery so it would have been something prior to the round in which you are now um, going to be producing a block so let me point out an immediate consequence of enforcing this assumption um, which is that if we succeed in enforcing a4 we will also wind up enforcing the property uh, that a given leader can only contribute at most one block to any given chain, right? So why is this true? Well, assumption A4 says that, you know, if, if you start from any block in the current entry and trace backward toward the genesis block, by assumption A4, the round numbers are only going to be strictly decreasing until you get back to the genesis block, which in some sense is round number zero. So in particular, you cannot have two blocks belonging to a common round R on any given chain. Okay, so it's true that um, a Byzantine node can produce, can create multiple blocks in step 2b if it's chosen as the leader. Um, so for example, it could create, you know, like a whole bunch of blocks that all sort of point back to exactly the same predecessor. That's totally allowed. Um, it's not going to be able to add more than one block to any particular chain. If it tries to sort of add a whole bunch of, ch uh, a big chain of round R blocks, the honest nodes are going to know to ignore all but, you know, for example, the first of those blocks. In proof of work blockchains, you actually get sort of a, a much stronger property just kind of for free because of how they're implemented, right? Which is, you know, as we said, you know, the winning lottery ticket you get in a proof of work blockchain, it actually includes encoded in it uh, exactly which block you must extend. And not only that, it even encodes exactly which block, like which transactions you must be extending that block with. So the lottery ticket, you know, takes away all your all your degrees of freedom in step 2b. There's literally only one thing you can do, even as a Byzantine node, in step 2b, if you're using a proof of work blockchain. So if you can only create one block in total, obviously you're only adding um, at most one block to any particular chain in the entry. Um, but I want to emphasize that stronger property is not what is driving uh, the fundamental consistency and liveness guarantees of longest chain consensus. We will prove consistency and liveness assuming only this assumption A4, which I've stated. We will not need the stronger properties you get um, from, for example, Bitcoin and its proof of work civil resistance mechanism. There are other aspects of proof of work that are useful in various ways, but again, I want to emphasize only by you know, crisply articulating exactly which assumptions the analysis requires only through this exercise do we realize fundamentally what it is about Bitcoin that gives it its consistency and liveness guarantees. 
And now that we understand that it's only these four assumptions and not, for example, the stronger assumption that, you know, it should be that a Byzantine node can only create one block in step 2b. Now, if we wanted to, for example, replicate the consistency and liveness properties of Bitcoin with a proof of stake implementation of longest chain consensus, now we know exactly what we need to do. We need to meet assumptions A1 through A4. It is totally fine if we're not able to replicate the stronger property of Bitcoin um, that you can only have one block proposed uh, per round. Our final assumption, assumption A5, this will have a different character. This will be a temporary assumption for lecture eight. This is going to be something we're going to relax later. Okay, so we're not worried about enforcing this. We're worried about understanding longest chain consensus under assumption A5, and then we'll extend all of our conclusions uh, without assumption A5. This assumption is going to be that we're working in what I'm going to call either the instantaneous communication model, or I might also call it the super synchronous model. So intuitively in your mind, you should think of it that as soon as one honest node knows anything, like knows about some block, instantaneously all of the other honest nodes know about that exact same block as well. And probably the simplest way to think about this assumption and the reason I sometimes call it the super synchronous model, it's basically like the synchronous model if we take parameter delta to be equal to zero. Okay, if we're thinking about a protocol where every honest node always keeps all of its colleagues up to date, always tells them everything it knows, you know, if there's no message delay, then instantaneously once a node learns something, all of the other nodes learn it uh, at exactly the same time. Now, you should, of course, object to this assumption. Uh, I mean, one objection would just be that it's not very realistic. In the real world, delta is not zero. So who am I to say that it is zero? I think an even more um, sort of uh, powerful objection would be to say, like, wasn't the whole point of, you know, state machine replication, this problem we've been obsessed with, wasn't the point to keep a bunch of nodes in sync? Wasn't that like the hard problem? Uh, and hasn't this just completely like trivialized that hard problem? Now I'm basically just assuming that all of the nodes stay in sync with each other. I mean, there's still liveness, but consistency, it, it kind of seems like we've completely trivialized it. And that'd be a good comment. That'd be a good criticism. I mean, to some extent that is true. We are assuming that any pair of honest nodes at a given moment in time are consistent with each other, have the same local histories of the transactions they view as sort of confirmed or finalized to date. But consistency also has a second aspect, which is sort of consistency with your future self, okay, in the sense that, right, and, and so we sort of disguised this in our previous discussion by referring to the local history as an append-only data structure. So if it's an append-only data structure, obviously your transcript right now, your local history right now, is a prefix of what it is at any future point. What we're going to see in longest chain consensus is that there's a very real danger of transactions, you know, first being regarded as confirmed or finalized and added to the local history, but then because of other things that happened with the protocol, getting rolled back. So sort of deleting from that, from that data structure. So this consistency with one's future self, this kind of um, actually really implementing an append only data structure, uh, we'll sometimes call this self consistency, we'll call it finality. And as we'll see, um, finality is not at all trivialized by this assumption of the instant communication model. It's still actually quite tricky to prove this self-consistency, this finality property of longest chain consensus, um, even in this sort of super synchronous instant communication model. Now, if we happen to be in this permissioned and synchronous and PKI world, then actually this assumption A5 is it's really just not that big a deal. Okay, it's true, delta is not equal to zero, um, but we can use off the shelf, we can use the Dole of Strong protocol for Byzantine broadcast to nonetheless, in effect, keep all of the honest nodes completely in sync just, you know, um, all the time, right? If in each round of, of uh, longest chain consensus, the honest nodes run the Dole of Strong protocol, by the agreement property of that protocol, they'll always wind up learning exactly the same stuff at the end of every round. Um, so just kind of as a consequence of that protocol's guarantees, honest nodes will stay in sync throughout longest chain consensus. So what's more interesting is the permissionless case, and we will then have to go back and sort of revisit this assumption A5 and start relaxing it. In particular, we'll do that um, in lecture nine. But let me just tell you right now, uh, all of the guarantees we prove in lecture eight, and we'll prove a bunch, all of the guarantees for longest chain consensus uh, carry over to the normal synchronous model, okay, with an arbitrary but known bound capital delta on the maximum message delay. What's important for that statement to be true is it should be that the uh, typical length of a round, the, the, number of the amount of time that elapses 
during a round should be reasonably large relative to capital delta, the maximum message delay. As long as that is true, you get basically exactly the same consistency and liveness guarantees from this lecture more generally in the synchronous model. So we're going to be proving a lot of guarantees about longest chain consensus in this lecture and lecture in lecture eight uh, for the for the instantaneous communication model. And believe it or not, you know, despite the fact this model seems very extreme, all of the difficult and interesting parts of the proofs of these guarantees will already manifest in this model, in the instantaneous communication model. Extending those results, you know, to the synchronous, the general synchronous model, you know, it takes some work, got to do some math, but honestly, all of the big ideas, all of the sort of, you know, parts of the proof that explain to you why longest chain consensus uh, really works, uh, really satisfies consistency and liveness with 49% Byzantine nodes, all of those ideas are already going to be present here in Lecture 8 uh, in the instantaneous communication model. So let me say a few words about where these five assumptions are going to wind up showing up in the forthcoming videos. So in this lecture, in Lecture 8, we're going to prove a number of sort of appealing guarantees that longest chain consensus has. Uh, and our analysis of longest chain consensus is going to be somewhat modular in the sense that we're going to factor the analysis into two parts that can be studied separately. In the first part, we're going to assume a particular condition holds on the sequence of leaders that get selected in step 2a uh, over the course of all of the rounds. So most of our results in lecture 8 are going to have the form, if the sequence of selected leaders has a particular property, it's going to be a balancedness property, as we'll see. If the leader sequence has a particular property, then we get everything we want. And in particular, consistency and liveness, uh, as long as there's at most 49% Byzantine nodes. So in this part of the analysis, which is going to start in the fifth video uh, of Lecture 8, it's going to be very obvious how we use a couple of these assumptions. So in particular, assumption A4 will be very explicit about the role that it plays in the proofs. Um, initially in that fifth video uh, to prove something known as the common prefix property. Uh, and it should feel intuitively clear as we do that proof that assumption A4 is sort of really crucial for longest chain consensus to have the guarantees that we want. So it's really paramount that any concrete uh, implementation of longest chain consensus manages to enforce assumption A4. In this same part of the analysis of longest chain consensus, again, beginning with the, the fifth video, uh, I think it should also be clear, um, it'll be clear how we use assumption A5, the sort of instant communication model. So it should be obvious that the assumption plays a role. I think it will also be clear from the argument that A5 is overkill. And that actually basically the same argument should work, you know, with maybe sort of a slightly more complicated proof uh, in the general synchronous model. So where you have an arbitrary uh, known um, upper bound capital delta on the maximum message delay, uh, at least as long as the uh, time that elapses in a single round is large uh, relative to the uh, network delay capital delta. All right, so assumptions A4 and A5, you know, be very obvious how we use them starting in the fifth video. Again, A4 is really essential to the argument. Um, A5 is overkill. You can replace that by just assuming that you're in the, the sort of regular synchronous model. It turns out we're also going to use assumption A1 okay, in that same part of the analysis. Uh, so in the fifth video, when we prove the common prefix property, uh, it's pretty subtle where that shows up in the proof. Um, so keep, a, keep an eye out and see if you can identify uh, in the proof of the common prefix property um, where it is that we use the assumption that Byzantine nodes do not have advanced knowledge of the genesis block. Now, don't forget, this part of the analysis is conditional in the sense that we're going to be proving results that have the form, if the sequence of leaders selected in step 2a, okay, over the course of the rounds, if the sequence of leaders satisfies a particular nice property, it's going to be a balancedness property. If that condition holds, then we get all of these nice consequences, like consistency and liveness uh, of longest chain consensus. So, but that still leaves us to argue that the leader sequence will, or sort of is very likely to have this balancedness property. So that is the subject of the other part of the analysis. And it's in this other part of the analysis that assumptions A2 and A3 are going to play an important role. So the one part of this lecture, lecture eight, where we're going to be doing this other part of the analysis uh, is going to happen in the fourth video. And what we're going to show there is that if in each round a leader is selected uniformly at random from all of the nodes running the protocol, if each leader is selected randomly, then with high probability, you're going to get a leader sequence that satisfies this nice balancedness property. So with high probability over the random choices of the leaders, we're going to get all of the properties we want, like consistency and liveness. 
So I may not really say much about it, but in that fourth video, we will be making the assumptions A2 and A3. We're going to be assuming that the protocol is capable of selecting a leader uniformly at random, and there's nothing any of the nodes can do about it. And one reason we won't kind of talk about it much explicitly in that video is in lecture eight, we're thinking of longest chain consensus in sort of a permission setting under the PKI assumption. Um, and as we discussed, assumptions A2 and A3 are, are actually pretty easy to enforce if you're in the permissioned PKI assumption. So where we're going to talk much more about assumptions A2 and A3 is when we talk about permissionless longest chain. So both the proof of work version in lecture nine and the proof of stake version in lecture 12. At that point, we're going to have to be uh, very careful, especially on the, in the proof of stake side in, in lecture 12, we're going to have to be very careful to make sure that assumptions A2 um, and A3 do actually correctly hold. If we can make sure that A2 and A3 holds, then we can piggyback on the analysis of random leaders we're going to do in the fourth video of this lecture, of lecture eight. So now that we understand what longest chain consensus is at a high level, now that we've established the parameters of what nodes can and cannot do in longest chain consensus, let's talk about what the honest nodes are supposed to do. Suppose an honest node finds itself selected as the leader uh, in some round. Now it's responsible for choosing a block and a predecessor. So which block and which predecessor is it supposed to propose? Well, first, um, the node is going to assemble a block, meaning a list of transactions, in the usual way. Okay, so when a node becomes a leader, it says, okay, what transactions do I know about? Maybe a client told me directly, or maybe I heard from some other node. Which, which transactions do I know about that haven't yet been um, executed, haven't yet been included in the blockchain, and you're just going to produce a block that includes all of those transactions. And what about the predecessor? Well, remember, at any given moment, a, a node knows about a collection of blocks that form an entry directed into the Genesis block. So what an honest node is supposed to do is look at this entry, look at the longest chain, okay, meaning the largest number of hops any node is from the root, from the Genesis block, and add its block to the end of the longest chain. So for example, in this orange entry on the right part of the slide, the longest chain would be three hops long. An honest node would then tack its block onto the end of that longest chain, making it even longer. In the picture, I've indicated in green where that new block would go if it were proposed by an honest node. Now, I'm sure it's occurred to you that an entry might well have uh, more than one longest chain. This one on the slide only has the unique longest chain, but you, know, you could have a second chain that also has the same length. Uh, and so then we're going to allow nodes to just um, tie break arbitrarily. So pick whichever longest chain you want um, and stick your block at the end of that. You could imagine having a more specific tie breaking rule. You could imagine that honest nodes are supposed to extend, you know, of the two ends of the longest chain, the one that they heard about first. You could imagine them tie breaking randomly. And all of those things are sometimes done in practice. But, but for the analysis, when we're proving consistency and liveness guarantees for longest chain consensus, we don't want to be relying on nodes sort of implementing some possibly delicate tie breaking procedure. We want liveness and consistency no matter how they tie break among competing longest chains. The final thing maybe seems obvious, but it is something a Byzantine node could deviate from, which is as an honest node uh, in a round where you're elected the leader and you form a block, you should immediately broadcast that new block to all of the other nodes in the system. So those are the three kinds of deviations by Byzantine nodes that we have to worry about, deviations from uh, honest behavior. As I said, the first one we're not really worried about. I mean, maybe Byzantine nodes sort of put together empty blocks, whatever, that's fine, as long as there's a bunch of honest, honest blocks out there as well. So on the third point, you know, totally possible the Byzantine node delays the announcement of some block and predecessor it committed to in some round in which it was selected as the leader. Uh, for today, for lecture eight, where we focus on liveness and consistency, um, actually this power of the adversary is not going to matter. Um, it's not going to interfere with our ability to get either consistency or liveness. It will make our proofs a little trickier, right, because we'll have to handle this sort of more general adversary than an adversary that's not allowed um, to delay the announcement of blocks, but it'll turn out to, to be fine for consistency and liveness. Now, while this power doesn't interfere with liveness or consistency, it actually does interfere with additional properties you might want a longest chain protocol to have. And we'll see that uh, in two lectures, in lecture 10, when we discuss a famous uh, selfish mining attack. So what selfish mining shows is that, you know, in a blockchain that uses block rewards, as, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum do, uh, actually, if the block producers are profit maximizing, it may be in their interest to sometimes withhold the announcement of a block that they create. That may seem very counterintuitive, but we'll talk about it at length in lecture 10. So for this lecture, lecture eight deviations on this third point only serve to make our proofs of liveness and consistency even stronger. Uh, in lecture 10, this will actually be a very important part uh, of what we allow the adversary to do. 
Deviations from the second point, uh, on the other hand, those should be immediately worrying, and those will play a big role uh, in this lecture. Uh, why are they worrying? Well, you know, honest nodes are trying to coordinate on, on a single longest chain. If everybody's honest, the longest chain is going to keep getting longer and longer and longer. On the other hand, if you have Byzantine nodes and they extend something other than the longest chain, it's not just that the old longest chain doesn't get longer. It also may be that they can switch what the longest chain actually is, leading to a rollback of transactions, a rollback, a rollback of blocks. So for example, if you have you know, some number of K rounds in a row, like say 10 rounds in a row, where you get unlucky and you happen to have a Byzantine leader in each of those 10 rounds, uh, they can actually, you know, through deliberate forking, cancel the previous nine blocks that have been added to the longest chain. So to see this, uh, consider the following picture. So let little b denote the kth to the last block on the current longest chain. So there's K minus one blocks currently after the block little b. So if we now have k dishonest uh, leaders in a row, well, the first one can extend b rather than extending the longest chain. The next one can extend the block produced by the previous dishonest leader, uh, and so on 10 times in a row. So the, um, the chain that ends with these magenta blocks, these uh, k blocks that were added consecutively by a bunch of dishonest leaders, that's now the new longest chain. And the last k minus one blocks that used to reside on the longest chain, the the K minus one blue blocks that are following the block little b, uh, those are no longer on the longest chain. Those are now excluded. That's also sometimes called those blocks are orphaned. This is kind of the extreme case where you have a bunch of dishonest um, leaders in a row. And so for example, if you have 10 in a row, they can cancel um, the last nine blocks on what used to be uh, the longest chain. But if you think about it, you have exactly this same problem. Um, if you ever have a window in time with many more dishonest nodes, dishonest leaders than honest leaders. So for example, if there's a sequence of a thousand sort of rounds in a row where you have 505 dishonest leaders and 495 honest leaders, so an imbalance of 10, it's again true for exactly the same reason uh, that you can successfully orphan uh, the last nine blocks on the old longest chain. And so that's a good exercise maybe if you want to if you want to think that through. So to wrap up this video, let me give you sort of three takeaways uh, from this discussion. Uh, so takeaway number one is whenever you're looking at a longest chain protocol, you should always regard the last few blocks uh, on the longest chain, the ones sort of at the very tip, um, you should view them as kind of tentative, as not yet confirmed, still under negotiation in effect. So we should consider a block confirmed only if it's one on the longest chain, but sort of also two kind of fairly deeply ensconced on the longest chain. So already having been extended uh, by a number of other blocks. You might be wondering how many blocks? <laughs> so how many times do you have to be extended before it's safe to consider that block to be finalized or confirmed? We'll tackle that sort of head on in the next video. So that's the first takeaway. Don't consider, don't sort of take the blocks at the end of the longest chain uh, too seriously. Consider them unconfirmed and still under negotiation. Um, the second takeaway is sort of looking ahead to the analysis we want to do in the next video. Right, so presumably we're going to want to, you know, prove some kind of guarantee about longest chain consensus of the form, you know, as long as sort of a block has been extended enough times on the longest chain, as long as it's deep enough on the longest chain, then you're safe to consider it finalized or confirmed. It's never going to be rolled back or canceled at any point in the future. And this example illustrates a kind of very basic obstruction to proving guarantees of that form, right? So this example says that, you know, whenever you have a sequence of leaders where there's significantly more dishonest leaders than honest leaders, well, you know, then some blocks might get rolled back and there's really nothing you can do about it. So if we're going to prove any kind of guarantee, like, you know, once you've been extended 10 times, you're never going to get rolled back, we have to, along the way, prove that for some reason you're never going to see a sequence of leaders where you have 10 more dishonest leaders than honest leaders. And indeed, when we do the analysis, you will see that is exactly the crucial ingredient. The third and final takeaway is this discussion should convince you that there's no hope of proving anything unless a strict majority of the nodes are honest. So at least 51% of the nodes should be honest and most 49% should be Byzantine. For example, imagine 51% of the nodes are Byzantine. Now consider a sequence of sort of a thousand consecutive rounds. Okay. We're expecting 510 of those leaders to be Byzantine and 490 of those leaders to be honest. Uh, and if that happens, that means there's an excess of 20 dishonest leaders and they're totally capable of canceling the last 19 blocks on the current longest chain. And of course, there's no reason to stop at a thousand. You could also go to 10,000, at which point you're going to expect an excess of 200 Byzantine nodes within that window who can then cancel the last 199 blocks on the current longest chain, and so on. 
So if you have a strict majority Byzantine nodes, there's really no hope. The Byzantine nodes ultimately can exert a total kind of control over uh, the blocks that get confirmed. So this argument shows that, you know, if you ever want to finalize a block ever, it's definitely a necessary condition that you have at least 51% honest nodes. Much less clear is whether that's a sufficient condition. And that's exactly what we'll show over the next several videos. We'll show that as long as at least 51% of the nodes are honest, then in fact you can eventually regard blocks as confirmed. A block that is both on the longest chain and has been extended a sufficiently large number of times, um, at that point you can be confident that it's not going to be rolled back at any point in the future. So we'll start that analysis in the, in the next video and I'll see you there.